morning, Grace Fellowship. Uh, if you've never met me before, if you're new here, I am Mark, I'm one of the pastors here, along with Clay, the guy who was doing the announcements and playing the drums. <clears throat> uh, last week, Clay finished up the story of the blind man who had been healed by Jesus. And today we get to dive into a new story, which is exciting for me. Um, but the only problem is, is that the scripture that we're going through today is almost an exact repeat of the scripture that I went through two weeks ago during the story of the blind man. So two weeks ago, after Jesus had healed this blind man, uh, we were at the very beginning of John chapter 10 and verses 1 to 6, where Jesus calls his followers sheep, and he admonishes the Pharisees that they don't believe him because they're not his sheep. You might remember that if you were here. And today we're taking verses 22 to 30 in chapter 10. Uh, this is a separate story. It takes place at a different time, uh, other than the one we've been going through the last few weeks. But Jesus is saying almost the identical words to these Jewish people as he was proclaiming to the Pharisees in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 10. And so, if, uh, if John, the author of this book, was inspired by God to write two portions of Scripture, giving the account of two different stories with almost the identical content in such close proximity to one another, uh, if he does it, we're going to do that too. So we're going to go through this again. It must be a very important lesson for us, so we will have to almost repeat it. And, and so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, or if you have uh, a Bible app of some form on your phone or on your iPad, or iPhone, turn to John chapter 10. We're going to be taking verses 22 to 31. And you, you can follow along in your Bibles or on your, on your apps as the video or the scripture video plays on the screen behind me. Reading from John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. All right, before we dive into this text, let's just uh, pray this morning. God, we come before you today, and we're just asking for a clearer picture of you this morning. We talk about you, and we claim to know you, and we claim to believe in you, but many times our lives don't show the reality of that. And so I pray that you would... Help us to understand the gospel today like we have never understood it before. I pray that the reality of the good news that you have given us would penetrate not only our minds but our hearts this morning. God, I just pray that Jesus would be our only hope. I pray that Jesus doesn't become to us just a crutch that we try to use when we're down or we need something from you, but rather I pray that Jesus becomes everything to us in the good times and in the bad. And so we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So, as with anything we learn from Scripture, it's good to know the context of the teaching that is taking place in these verses. And today we find in verse 22 and 23, the first verses of our text, that the story that we're going through today happens during the winter and during the Feast of Dedication. Verses 22 and 23, at that time the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Now, as we've been going through this book of John as a church, uh, we've come across multiple feasts. If you, rem if, if you can remember back that far, there was a wedding feast where Jesus turned water into wine. We've also gone through the Feast of Passover, which found its roots in the Old Testament story of God delivering his people from the Egyptian pharaoh who had enslaved the Israelite nation. God had commanded his people to observe this feast to remember his deliverance. And we've gone through the Feast of Booths, which was also called the Feast of Tabernacles, which also found its roots in the Old Testament. 
And it was to commemorate a time after God's people had been delivered from Egypt when they had wandered around in the desert for 40 years living in booths or tents or tabernacles. And uh, it was another feast that was commanded by God for the Israelite nation for them to remember what had been done for them. Now this feast that we find today in this text is never once mentioned in the Old Testament. And we can't find it anywhere in the pages of the scripture that these Jewish people would have had. And so, this feast is a feast that actually did not exist during that time. This feast of dedication that we find here in John chapter 10 is something that the history books tell us originated sometime between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's around 400 years of history between the two testaments of the Bible, the two covenants, um, in which nothing new was written as far as Scripture is concerned. And during this time... There was uh, quite a difficult time for the Israelite nation. And so what had happened is uh, Seleucid, King Antiochus Epiphanes, took over the Jewish temple and he forced the Jews to abandon their religion. They desecrated the temple and outlawed Judaism. And now during that time, there was a group of Jewish fighters who revolted and they took back the temple and they used the only remaining undefiled oil to light the candles on the menorah in the temple. And this feast that Jesus was at here, this feast of dedication that takes place in John chapter 10, was to commemorate that time when Judah Maccabees, the, leaders, the leader of the Jewish uh, fighters, took back that temple and lit those candles with that oil. Now this feast traditionally took place in the winter, as was mentioned here in verse 22. And sometimes it was called the Feast of Maccabees. Sometimes it was called the Feast of Dedication after, the, or after they dedicated the temple. And today that feast is called Hanukkah. And the symbol for this holiday is often the menorah, the candles that the fighters lit when they took back the temple. With, they lit these candles with the last remaining undefiled oil. And so this feast that Jesus was at in this story is not an old feast. It was maybe around 200 years old as opposed, as opposed to all the other feasts that they would have had that were commanded by God in the Old Testament law. Those feasts would have been thousands of years old. And this feast was also a feast that was not commanded by God, but rather had been instituted by the Jewish people. Now that's not a bad thing, but it is of note that this particular feast was not a feast that was a part of the Old Testament law given by God. It was not commanded by him. Now, often throughout this book, we've seen Jesus hanging out at feasts. That's what he does. And even at this feast, which was not a scriptural feast or a religious feast, he was still there. Jesus didn't limit himself to his religious feasts, but he also hung out during the cultural feasts as well. Much like we ourselves don't have to limit ourselves to religious feasts and holidays, but we can also take part in cultural holidays and celebrations as well, like Thanksgiving and New Year's and like we just had open house at the fire hall here in Warman. We can take part in that. Jesus was involved in the culture because he came to save the people who were a part of it. And so too, we must be willing to become involved in the culture that God has put us in as people who are his agents in this culture. And so Jesus is walking around at this feast at the temple in Jerusalem and some of the Jews, they come up to him and ask him if he is the Christ. Verse 24, so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now by this time, obviously Jesus had gained for himself quite a reputation for himself, both good and bad, among the Jewish people, depending on which side of the fence you were on about his identity as the Messiah. Whether you believed that he was the Messiah or not would have really shaped your view of him. Was Jesus a bad person claiming to be God, which would be blasphemy? Or was what he was saying really true? These Jews could really only have those two views of him. They couldn't be apathetic about who he was claiming to be. They must have an opinion. He's either the worst blasphemer of God, that, of God the Father that has ever existed by claiming to be God's Son, or the Pharisees were blasphemers claiming that Jesus was not God when he really was God. And these Jews, they asked Jesus this weird question, verse 24. How long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. Now, one might have assumed 
that Jesus, all throughout this book of John, we're in the 10th chapter already, and as we've been walking through this book, it's been quite obvious that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, but for some reason, it was not obvious to these Jewish people. These Jewish people, when they ask Jesus if he's the Christ, they are really asking him if he's the one that they've been waiting for for so long to deliver them from Roman rule. They had no idea that Jesus Christ had come for a much bigger salvation. He came to save them from their sin. Now, many of them were expecting a Messiah or a Savior to come to the world to save them from the oppression of this Roman culture, this Roman rule. It had been prophesied in the Old Testament Scripture that a Savior would come, a Messiah would come, and the name for their Messiah was the Christ. And so they want to know, are you really the one who's going to save us? Tell us clearly. Don't beat around the bush. No more riddles. No more parables. Just tell us. Now, in my opinion, it looks like throughout this book of John, he's already been telling them very plainly that he was the Messiah. But if we look through the book of John, we don't find that Jesus has been telling the Jewish people in what you could say plain language that he was the Messiah or that he was the Christ. He almost always made the people think about his identity through the telling of parables, metaphors about who he really was. The only time up to this point... In the book of John, where Jesus plainly tells someone that he is the one that was to come or that he was the Messiah, is in John chapter 5 to the Samaritan woman at the well. He never mentions in public to the Jewish people that he is their Messiah. Now, Jesus has done many miracles, though. He's been healing people, raised people from the dead, turning water into wine, which one would think would prove that he is not only from God, but that he himself was God. But up to this point, these Jewish people just don't get it. They just do not believe him. They wanted him to say it plainly. So why would Jesus not have told them plainly up until this point that he was the Christ, that he was God, that he was the Savior? We find the answer in the next verse, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Basically, he's saying, my works or the things that I do bear witness about me. The miracles I perform should be enough. I shouldn't have to tell you as well. Now, if we put that kind of in today's context, I mean, if someone walked up to you and said to you that, say, they were the best hockey player in the world, would you believe them? Probably not, right? Words are easy, words are cheap when coming out of the mouth of a human, right? Jesus could have just told everyone that he was the Savior of the world, that he was God, that he was the Son of God, the Father, and he did to a few people. But what reason did they have to believe him? None, if it was only words out of the mouth of a human. Now, many thought that he was just a man, and so in their minds, his words actually don't hold a lot of weight. They don't mean much. Words are cheap. And so Jesus knew that if he only used words, then they would not believe him because they view him as only human, even though they're just asking for words here. Just tell us, Jesus, are you the Messiah? They're just asking for words. And so he makes clear claims about himself with words, but he proves who he is by his works. He does miracles, and people start asking about him. How can you do that? Who are you? And so by his works, he's afforded the opportunity to clarify his identity with words. And they hold weight now because of his works. He must be God because of the things he does. It's much like this. If you go to an Edmonton Oilers hockey game and you watch the Oilers play and you see Connor McDavid play hockey. Now, some of you might have no idea who he is, but he's like the superstar in the NHL. He's like the best of the best. Um, and that kind of pains me to say that because I'm a Canucks fan, so it's difficult for me to say, but it is the truth. And by watching him, if you watch this guy play, you're going to know that he's good. Like, he's got to be one of the best, or he is the best hockey player in the world. Now, after he's done playing the game, and if you were so lucky to get the chance to talk to him, and you got to ask him a question, and you asked him, well, are you the best player in the world? He, he wouldn't even have to answer you, he could just say, well, I mean, you said it, right? I mean, because you saw him score three goals in one night on the opening night in the NHL, and no one's ever done that before for the Edmonton Oilers, I mean, he just proved by what he did that he was the best hockey player. He doesn't have to say it. 
There's no question that he's the best hockey player in the world. The things that he did as you watched him play prove or bear witness to who he is, the best hockey player in the world. He didn't have to tell you plainly because you just saw it for yourself. Jesus in verse 24 here is telling these Pharisees the same thing. I told you and you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Why should he have to tell them he is the Messiah or the Savior or the Christ? He has been doing miracle after miracle. He has proven his power and the fact that he has come from God the Father over and over. He's turned water into wine. He's healed the, the lame. He's healed the sick. He's healed the blind. He's raised the dead for crying out loud. And now they want him to say plainly that he's the Savior of the world. Why? What purpose does that serve? It should be obvious by what he does that he is God. But you know, even John the Baptist at one point when he was in prison had doubts about if Jesus really was the Messiah. And so he sends messengers to Jesus to ask him if he's the one or, or should they expect a different Messiah? And Jesus responds to the messengers in this way. Matthew 11, verses 4 to 6. Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus uses his works to prove to John the Baptist that he has been sent by God as the Messiah. His works are the proof that he uses. These miraculous signs are happening. He says, look at what I do. I am the Messiah. Words are cheap, but the actions of Jesus prove that he is the Savior of the world far more than any words he would have ever said to these Jewish people. My works bear witness about me, he says. What I do proves it. I am the Savior of the world. Now, if you were... To ask Connor McDavid if he was the best hockey player in the world, I don't know why you would have to ask the question. It should be obvious by how he plays hockey. You're like, hey, Connor, are you the best? It would just seem like a dumb question to ask, right? It's just honest, or it's just obvious that he is the best hockey player in the world. The only reason you would ask him would be to get some sort of response from him. If he says yes, you can call him conceited, arrogant, self-centered. If he says no, he's lying. It's a no-win question. And it's the same with Jesus. Throughout this book, they've been trying to trap him by his words. And Jesus knows that in the eyes of these Jewish people, him saying that he's the Christ proves absolutely nothing to them. And so why do they want him to say it? They want him to say it because they've been trying over and over to catch Jesus in his words that he would say something by which he could be called a blasphemer. They want to accuse him of blasphemy, of claiming to be God, which was punishable by death in their Jewish law. And we can find that in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. And so if they can coax him into saying that he is God, then in their minds, because he was not God, he would be blaspheming and they would be, have a just cause to put him to death. And we'll see this in verse 31 as we go through that next week, that they're going to try and stone him. Even though he doesn't say plainly with words that he is the Christ, he goes too far. So why do they not believe him even though he's proven himself to be the Savior of the world over and over? I'll answer this way. What logical reason would there be to not believe that Connor McDavid is the best hockey player in the world? How could you not believe it? Even though he proves it night after night on the ice. Well, the only way you could not believe that he's the best player in the world is if you choose to be a fan of some other hockey player or some other team, perhaps, and you are choosing to cheer for the opposition despite all the evidence that is there that Connor is the best. Now, maybe you're just not a fan of Connor McDavid, and no matter how hard you try, you just can't become a fan of his, and so you just will not believe he's the best despite all logical evidence. Jesus gives the same sort of answer for why these Jewish people do not believe in him in verses 26 and 27. But you do not believe me because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus goes back to speaking about sheep again. If you were here two weeks ago, you'll remember the story of the blind man that was healed and how Jesus referred to 
sheep a lot when he's confronting the Pharisees after they had objected to Jesus healing this blind man on the Sabbath day. And he almost gives the exact same speech here to these Jewish people again. The same speech that he gave to those Jewish leaders in verses 1 to 6 of chapter 10. Why don't they believe Jesus? Because they're not his sheep. They're not fans of him. They don't like him and what he stands for. But Jesus' sheep, they hear his voice and they follow him. Now, why don't you believe that Connor McDavid is the best hockey player ever? Because you're not his fan. You don't like him. You're not a fan of the Oilers. It's the same sort of reason that people don't believe Jesus. They're just not his sheep. After all that Jesus had done to prove that he's the Savior of the world, that great shepherd of the sheep, they would not believe him because they were not his sheep. And I want you to notice how the order is not reversed here. Just as it's not reversed in verses 1 to 6. He doesn't say that you are not my sheep because you do not believe me. But rather he said, you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. Now Jesus is not telling us that in order to become one of his sheep, we must do the work of believing in him. No, he's telling us that our belief in him is a result of us being one of his sheep. There's a very important distinction here. His sheep hear his voice and they believe. And I think it's important that we understand the fact that even our belief in Jesus is a gift from him. It's not something we must work towards. If we think we must do the work of believing and we must continue to do the work of believing, then when we come across moments where we have doubts, we'll start thinking that our salvation hangs in the balance because of our own works or the lack of our own works. And if that's our view, then we're forgetting that our salvation is all of Jesus' works, not ours. If you come into times of doubt, it's not our job to muster up enough faith to believe. It's your job to repent and believe because Jesus has already done the work of salvation in you. And that's how God's gift of salvation works. We need to understand that God's gift to us is irrevocable. Jesus tells these Jewish people here how one becomes a sheep in the fold of God. And this is how one becomes one of Jesus' sheep. Jesus says here in verse 28 and 29, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. You see, God the Father gives Jesus Christ his sheep and Jesus Christ gives them eternal life through his death and his resurrection on the cross. And to me, this is the most important thing that you can know about your salvation if you are someone who is saved. Just as you couldn't save yourself, you cannot keep yourself saved. If you're saved by the grace of God, you can rest in the finished work of Jesus on the cross if you are his child, he has made you his child, and there is no better news than that. When Jesus calls his sheep, they come, they repent, and they believe, because they're his sheep. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. In verse 27, Jesus does not just know about us if we are his sheep, but he knows us intimately. He knows our sin and our shame, our embarrassing and shameful past. He knows all about that. And he still decided to save us from a judgment that we deserved. All throughout the New Testament, when Jesus called his people, they came. They may not have known him, but he knew them. He called Zacchaeus out of a tree, and Zacchaeus ran down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, despised, a sinner. Jesus called Matthew to himself as a disciple, a tax collector as well, sitting at his tax booth, and he just went with Jesus. No questions asked, no explanation needed. Matthew 9 tells us, it, it just says, he literally just rose up and followed Jesus. That was it. He was one of Jesus' sheep now. Jesus called his disciples, James and John, out of the boat that they were in. They were mending their nets and they just followed Jesus when he was called. They didn't ask any questions. Their dad was left in the boat fixing nets all by himself. His boys were gone. Jesus called them. Jesus called them, and they followed him. Jesus calls those who are his, they turn, and they follow. If you are a sheep of the great shepherd, you will hear him, and you will follow him. Those two things you will do because you are his. You hear, and you follow, because that's what sheep do. And verse 29 says that if you're his sheep, no one will be able to snatch you out of God the Father's hand. You see, God is all-powerful. 
When he takes his own, there is nothing that has enough power to remove you from his hand. Jesus states that very plainly here. When we've been given eternal life by Jesus Christ, that eternal life is not able to be lost because if it was, it would not be eternal life. If you could lose your eternal life, then you would. We're not capable of hanging on to it. But praise be to God that he is able to hang on to it. Jesus Christ is God and he has the power to do that. Let's read verses 28 to 30. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now these Pharisees, they wanted Jesus to tell them plainly that he is the Christ and so Jesus does it. And it should now be plain to them by these words that he says. But again, he did it in somewhat of a roundabout way. He tells them that all he does, all his works, the fact that it's him who grants eternal life, the fact that he is God's son, all these things prove that he is the Christ. But he doesn't say, I am the Christ in those exact words. He says, I and the Father are one. Now this, these words, I and the Father are one, this was close enough to blasphemy for these Pharisees. He didn't say, I'm the Christ, but it was clear enough to them that he was claiming to be God with his words. And we'll see next week, they're going to try and stone him to death for these words. After all Jesus did, they still would not believe Jesus. They were not his sheep, and so they could not believe him. They hate him and what he stands for. He's not the savior they had pictured. They had pictured someone flashier, a military leader who would deliver them from Rome, but Jesus came to deliver them from sin and death, something so much better, and they just don't get it. Now, today there are those here, maybe who are much like these Jewish people. They look through scripture, try to twist verses to make them mean different things, to disprove Christ and the gospel. Maybe they take verses out of context of the entire Bible and make them mean something they do not mean, trying to make it seem as though this gospel simply cannot be true. Jesus simply cannot be God. Now, these people were trying to do that. They wanted Jesus to just say something that would trap him into somehow breaking their law by what he said. They wanted to take his words and twist them into blasphemy. And the thing is, it was not the words that Jesus said that proved that he was God. It was his actions. It was a reality they couldn't deny, and yet they did. When you look at the overwhelming evidence of Jesus being the Christ today, what is your reaction? Do you try and explain him away as these Jewish people tried? To try and point out some perceived contradiction in Scripture Instead of looking to the overwhelming evidence that Jesus did come to earth, he did die for your sin. He did not stay dead, but he rose again so you could have a seat at the table in his kingdom. Do you look for some way to disprove that? Are you like all the Connor McDavid haters who for no good reason dislike him, who despite all the evidence that he's the best hockey player in the world, they still refuse to acknowledge it? Are you like these Jewish people who did that to Jesus, despite all the evidence that Jesus was the Christ, they just refused to acknowledge it. And they look for some, some possible mistake that he might make to prove that he just is not the Messiah. Despite all the good he did, all the miracles that proved Jesus was God, they wanted to, Jesus to say it plainly so they could charge him with blasphemy. Is that us this morning? Or are you one of those who's like Zacchaeus the tax collector or Matthew or James or John or Philip or Nathan or all the other apostles and all the other people that Jesus called, the blind man. These guys who didn't need evidence, although the evidence was clear, they saw the character of Jesus, they heard his call and they followed him. When Jesus calls you, you follow him. Do you hear his call this morning? If you are a sheep of his, he will rescue you from your sin and punishment. He will save you to abundant eternal life. He will hold you in his hands and he will never let you go.
There is nothing that can separate his sheep from his love. So if you hear his call this morning, follow him. If you haven't yet responded to the good news of the gospel and you feel that Jesus is calling you to him, please listen to the call, turn, and follow him. Believe in him and be baptized into his kingdom. He truly is the good shepherd. He promises us eternal life, eternal rest in his kingdom. Now this is the good news, should you believe it. Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who rescues your sheep. Because on our own we're lost. Jesus, we pray for a miracle of salvation in this community. That the gospel would be preached and understood by those who are your sheep. There are many who, despite all evidence, will choose to reject you. And there are those who will receive this gift by faith. I pray for a miracle. A miracle of immense faith in you, in this community of Warman. Jesus, as a community, we want to repent for putting possessions and relationships and time and money, family, all ahead of you. I pray that you would just bring this community into a realization of who you are and of what you've done. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.